Good morning, almost good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Goodman. I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. It's really great to have you with us today on this all important topic of fundraising for community preservation projects. Uh, most of you know the Preservation Alliance, we're the statewide historic preservation nonprofit. Uh, our, one of our core, core goals is to help organizations like you, help an expanding group of people like you working on community preservation projects. Uh, we're all about getting more investment in special places in our communities across the state, all about uh, expanding knowledge of preservation practices and preservation's benefits and all about expanding the movement. So there's even more of us doing the great work that you're doing on the ground for all those reasons you know, making wonderful communities, stewarding wonderful communities and um, contributing to local economies as well. Um, you all are a great group today. I think a few more people are continuing to join us. Uh, we're not going to have you introduce yourself at this point, um, but I'll set the stage by saying I think about three quarters of you have active bricks and mortar projects that you're either um, planning, getting started on in the middle of, or um, uh, uh, robustly trying to get to the end of. Uh, a great mix there, a great mix of geography, people from all over the state, big projects, small projects, and some friends from out of state as well. Uh, and I'll just mention, we're really gonna focus mostly on um, kind of that uh, campaign focus for community preservation projects right now, bricks and mortar projects in the session today, but know a lot of you are also, or some of you, not a lot, some of you are also um, raising money for sort of organization year to year and thinking about things like membership and business support, annual fund and things like that. Um, so it'll be a mix. Um, it's wonderful to have the two uh, panelists speakers with me today, uh, Byron Champlin and Robert Wilson. Um, Byron has had a career in communications. He was the regional director um, for foundation and community relations at a, a well-regarded um, institution here in um, Concord. And he's been an effective board member on many arts community development and cultural boards, including the Preservation Alliance. And um, Robert Wilson is a retired oral surgeon who's a fundraising legend, I believe, um, and many others do too. He's raised millions of dollars for organizations like New Hampshire Historical Society, Canterbury Shaker Village, Capital Center for the Arts, and is currently working to help a great historic church, a congregation for a great historic church in Hopkinton. Um, I, both of these folks have um, worked with staff organizations, but um, they, like others at the Preservation Alliance, are certainly understand the demands of uh, smaller volunteer organizations and what it's like to juggle things and keep up the energy as a busy volunteer. Uh, our goal for this session, as advertised, is to try to answer some questions, give you a few takeaways that you can put into practice, and hopefully a dose of inspiration as well. Um, I know for me, these, these sessions um, help me sort of recommit, maybe revise some plans that I have, or give me some new ideas, and hope it does for you as well, and really want you to participate with your um, questions and suggestions. So in terms of our time together, I'm going to offer just, um, I think it's four slides on some big concepts to sort of set the stage. Then I'm going to turn to um, Byron and to Bob and ask them a set of just uh, three or four different questions. Again, just underscore some major points. And then we're going to open it up. Sound good? Sound good enough? I'm going to share my screen for those few slides. Can you see that? Yeah, can you sit next to you? And we are recording this session. I forgot to mention that. Um, and um, please keep muted if you're not speaking just to for the, for the benefit of everybody else. So here's today's topic, talking about fundraising strategies for community preservation projects. Um, just really wanted to start with this um, critical topic about where the money comes from. Uh, we're certainly very fortunate in New Hampshire to have matching grant programs like 
the Land and Community Heritage Investment Program for preservation projects. Um, you know, there's great stories of national grants being secured from different organizations uh, at the, in the Granite State. But this point is just so important to underscore that such a high percentage of giving for uh, philanthropic um, ventures come from individuals. Um, I, 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 these are numbers from 2019, and I double checked the numbers from last year from the same source. And um, not surprisingly, during the pandemic, foundation gifts got a little bigger piece of the overall pie, but as you would expect, a lot of that was for social service sort of things, and corporate giving actually dropped a little bit because of the uncertain economic times. So just really important to underscore this point, I think, that individuals are such an important part of fundraising focus. And I have a couple of uh, pyramids to show just to make a couple of other key points. Um, uh, you can uh, quibble with the details of different kinds of pyramids, but um, think this concept about um, that even the most successful sort of grassroots campaigns or crowdsourcing campaigns have elements of this concept in it, that leadership gifts are really important and the base is really important and that you need multiple prospects to be able to be successful with the, the gifts that you secure. So that's what this pyramid is all about, a classic tool to use in capital campaign sort of fundraising and kind of shifting to a more organizational perspective. Um, just this idea of sort of um, multiple levels of engagement and deepening engagement in, in this graphic as you go up the ladder. So um, uh, going from a prospect to somebody who feels so committed to your organization or your venture that they're making a bequest. Um, and I, I guess I also just this deepening of engagement and commitment to the organization is so important. Um, especially important to folks that are doing ongoing efforts and sustaining ventures, sustaining organizations. But I also would say, even if you're in a campaign mode, um, thinking about those relationships in an ongoing way is really important. There could be a later phase to your project or you as a volunteer might get involved in another preservation project in town and having those relationships and thinking of deepening the engagement is so important. Um, and this is sort of a variation on the same theme, again, more sort of from the organizational fundraising um, idea, um, one-time donors deepening the commitment, um, hopefully being, becoming reoccurring members, participating in your annual fund. Um, and I guess I would make the point that a planned gift doesn't have to be the biggest gift at the top of the pyramid, but it shows this deep commitment. Um, and that often things like annual funds and major gifts are obviously going to be a, a smaller portion of your overall donor base. So I know at the Preservation Alliance, um, a third of our members typically give to our year-end annual fund. A smaller but growing uh, group of those individuals are giving major gifts. So just um, ways to think about the big picture whether it's an organizational commitment that you're looking for on an ongoing way or you're in the campaign mode. Um, and before I shift to ask some questions of uh, Byron and Bob, these are just some um, critical tips that uh, fundraising experts um, share with us and we wanted to make sure we shared with you. Successful fundraising starts with a plan. We'll talk a little bit about that and we'll also talking about um, making your case and, and during this session I would just love to get phrases or words or concepts from you that you think are most engaging around the, these preservation projects that we're trying to accomplish. People give to people and this whole metric about um, how the ask is really a small part of your investment and, and relationship with an individual donor. So. Those are just some ideas to warm us up, so to speak. Um, let me turn now to my two great panelists. Um, starting with the plan seems pretty basic, uh, Byron and Bob. Um, Byron, do you wanna go first and just uh, 
this is an, it's, it's more art than science maybe in terms of your answer, but what do you want to share with people just in terms of what's important about the planning part of all of this? Well, I mean, first of all, I think you need to, you need to have a firm idea and you need to be able to provide your, your, um, uh, your folks who are making the ask with a clear idea of what the mission is and what the purpose is uh, of this particular capital campaign or this particular effort. Um, it's good to have uh, talking points with information. Anybody who sits down with uh, or approaches a, a prospective donor should really be able to articulate clearly wh why what you're asking them to support is important, what the vision is ultimately, and also be familiar with the fundamentals of the, of the organization. Uh, so I think that that's, that's really, really critical. Um, and, you know, the other thing is that, that they, should, they should really know uh, who they're going to solicit. They should know about the person who they're talking to uh, and, and, and not just be called. I mean, ideally, you have someone talking to a prospective donor who, who has a personal relationship with them already. Uh, but if they don't, it's important to help for, for the, the, the solicitor, for lack of a better word, uh, to to know something about the person that they're talking to. Yeah. Bob, what kind of things do you want to add to that? Thank you, Byron. I think what that all comes down to is the formation of a case statement. Mm -hmm. You need to put down in writing what exactly is, first of all, the mission of the organization, and secondly, what the needs are for why this campaign is taking place in the first place because without that case statement, then you really have nothing to fall back on. And with, you have other solicitors uh, other than the lead person and who's the campaign chair, uh, they need to have something to hang on to and to take with them to the people that they're going to be soliciting. Okay. And ideally that case statement uh, will be in the hands of the, uh, the person that you want to solicit before you even make that call yeah. so that they'll be familiar with why you're there and what you're asking for. Yeah, that's great. Let's pull back a little bit. When you're putting together your team to do a project like this, um, how do you find those people? What kinds of people do you need? Do you need only people who have done fundraising before? Oh, no. Leading question. No. <laughs> <laughs> The key to having a team that's going to be effective is that there are people who, first of all, believe in what you're doing. They need to believe what the campaign is all about. And I don't mean just lip service. I mean it's to the bottom of their soul because one of the key elements of a successful ask is the enthusiasm of the person who's doing the asking. Uh, because it's infectious. If you're excited about this and you know exactly what this is all about, what it's going to accomplish, what the end result is going to mean to the organization, that gets translated very quickly, not just in your body language, but in how you present this. And if they catch the disease, they will succumb. <laughs> You took the words right out of my mouth, Bob. It is kind of like in these days of COVID, it really is like transmitting a, a virus. You know, you need to make sure that 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 your uh, your team, uh, everything Bob says, believes in the mission, they have a passion for it, and that they they express and communicate that passion because people give to projects that there's some real excitement around, and that needs to be communicated. And then we can talk more about logistics if people have questions about that later. I mean, obviously using tools like that pyramid idea, keeping focused on where the money's really gonna come from and not getting distracted by an event that's taking too much time or whatever is, is really important. Setting a schedule, but um, being you know reflect flexible as needed related to that schedule all those kinds of things are important yes I, I, yeah, schedule is a real good point uh, Jennifer I mean I, I think that fundamentally there has to be someone in charge and somebody needs to be uh, kind of in the old cattle uh, drive uh, sense being the ramrod somebody has to basically be be keeping track of who's supposed to ask who and, and have they done that 
And if they haven't done that, they need to be reminded that, that they're supposed to talk to person A, B, or C. Um, and uh, you know that's really vital. You can't really let this happen organically. Somebody has to be in charge and has to be keeping track of people's uh, assignments and, uh, and whether or not they've fulfilled them. And how do you come up with the in another core part of the plan is obviously who you're who you're asking. So as I said, that we have some great, so a few wonderful sources in New Hampshire like Elchip. Um, but what about the list of individuals, or how do you think about that when you're in those early stages? Who do you, who are you coming up with? If you're a membership organization, obviously you have your members. Um, if and that would be where you really would begin to know the number of people and, and that are in the organization. And if you're a membership organization, obviously you're going to have members who are participating. Uh, you're going to have probably uh, a all too significant group that are members simply so it shows up in their obituary, but they never did anything. Uh, but usually uh, the leadership of an organization will know among their membership who are the people who are active, who really care that they're members and the organization they belong to. That's great. You also, yeah, as an organization, I think you should also be keeping track of anyone who's ever made a contribution or given you any money. I think the last time we did this, I told the story about an organization that I was involved with, which transitioned from being a state agency to a nonprofit, which was a very different type of environment. Um, and I discovered that that as, an, as a state agency, they had not bothered to keep a running list of everyone who had given them money. Uh, you know, and so when they transitioned to be a nonprofit, they really did not have a, a database of, of donors that they could you know, uh, fall back on. So you as an organization, you know, no matter how new or old you are, you really should be making sure that you keep a, a good accessible database, which, which may sound like a, an intimidating word, but just keep a spreadsheet or a list of everyone who's given you money and their contact information, because that's really part of, in addition to your members, uh, and those lists may overlap, that's really the group that you have to draw upon. And if you're really starting from whole cloth, you know, you don't have what these two gentlemen have just suggested, um, you know, using your network to brainstorm names, looking at other successful organizations in town. You know, if you're working on the meeting house, maybe there was a great library campaign eight years ago. Well, your committee or your friends and network are gonna know people on that list. Um, you know, connect with the Preservation Alliance if you're doing a bridge project to see how other bridge projects around the state might have been successful. There might be a few names or there might be some concepts in that in that previous success that you can adopt for yours. Um, and on a, another very specific level, uh, when you're at a certain place sort of ready to talk about it, we really find that the um, regional folks at the charitable foundation can be a very useful source to kind of brainstorm names or maybe there's advised funds folks at the charitable foundation who might be interested in your project. So using the networks, I guess, are my big theme and the charitable example is just charitable foundation example is just one very specific uh, way that you might be able to unlock some ideas, kinds of people and also individuals that might be supportive of your venture. Um, Let's talk about approach to donors. Um, uh, what are common mistakes that people make? What is your advice to people as they're going into that meeting? Why don't you, you two offer some um, general advice with Bob going first, and then if it feels like it flows, um, the two have offered to actually do a little role play for you too. But let's start with just some common mistakes or advice that you typically give your peers doing this sort of work for yourself before you go in to ask somebody for money. Know your donor. Know your donor, what they're interested in, um, what their background in philanthropy is, uh, that the 
things that you need to know before you sit down with them. Because if you go blind without knowing the interests of this person um, or their past record in, in, and their capacity for giving, uh, it, you really make a horrible mistake because if you, it doesn't seem possible that you would do it, but believe me, I know it ha has happened. And it's so important to know who you're calling and, and what their interests are. Um, you need to listen to the person that you're soliciting because they will tell you what they're going to do. Yeah. I would also say, uh, don't lowball your ask. Um, uh, there, you know, uh, I, I think that sometimes there's a hesitance to ask for too much. Um, and I, I mean, I defer to Bob because to me, he's the, he's the Zeus uh, in all of this and I'm just a Mercury. <laughs> but but, but I, I think that it's better to ask for too much than ask for too little. Uh, because uh, there are some, you know, in some cases you'll be leaving money on the table to be kind of, you know, uh, uh, somewhat callous, but, but true, I think. And the other is that there are people who will be insulted if, you know, you're, you're, you don't, cons because, you know, kind of what you ask them is, is an indicator of the value you place in them and their support in this, in this enterprise. You can, uh, I've, I've, had some, I've had some great teachers and one of the best said to me, you know, Bob, you can always negotiate down. You can never negotiate up. Exactly. And then knowing your donor, I would make the specific point about if it's a couple or a family, who are you meeting with, right? You, you, you need to be careful about that too. Who, who in the couple makes the financial decisions? Who should be at the meeting? That's she an does. Important, that's, that's an important <laughs> subset part. Yeah, and the listening. Um, I've seen that backfire on people just fill in and don't let the person respond or don't find out enough about their interests because they're too busy talking. Yeah. Can I give a classic example? Yes, please. Uh, this happened at a major campaign at a wonderful institution. And we had someone that, uh, a corporate person who was very, very interested in a specific um, type of, of uh, machinery at this institution. And the person who was taking them around and was going to be the lead solicitor and has also happened to be the chair of the board, uh, took them around. And when they went past the building where this machinery was that this person that was going to be solicited wanted to see, he said, oh, you don't want to see that. We haven't cleaned that machinery in a long time. Oh, no. We need to show you something else. Well, when it came time for the ask, uh, the poor fellow who had been dragged around looking at things he didn't really wasn't interested in said, well, you know, I'll have to think about it, but really I'm, I just was hoping I could see this, but it's okay. I understand that you had your priorities. Notice your priorities, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> and they got no gift. And yeah. it was, it That's was, a very stark example for sure. It is. Yeah. Do you want to pretend that you're asking for money for the gas holder, Bob, or is there something else near and dear to your heart? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Well, uh, it's a, it's a role, you, unrehearsed role play. Who am I calling on? Mr. Champlin. Oh, Mr. Champlin. Who is he? Who's Mr. Champlin? Well, you know, let me think. I'll Google him and see what shows up. Well, now that I know that, uh, I have written a letter to Mr. Champlin explaining what I'm doing and that I will be calling him in about a week to 10 days to set up an appointment to sit down with him. I've written that letter. And so about 10 days later, I've called you, Byron, and we talked on the phone. Yes, I'd be glad to see you, you said, and we have set a date. 
And so uh, the date has come. Uh, ring, 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 knock, 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 and you answer the door. Hey, Bob, uh, thanks. Uh, it's uh, good to see you. Come on in. Oh, thanks, Byron. How's the family? Uh, they're well. They're well. Uh, you know, uh, the grandkids are growing and, uh, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're getting to the age, uh, you know, they're, uh, one of them's applying to college, graduating this year, and another one is uh, in junior high school. Uh, so things, things are good, and, you, and with yours. Well, yeah, I've had the happy circumstance of a grandson graduating from Harvard, and uh, that was a great thing. That was a great thing. It really was. Congratulations. The pageantry and the buildings and so forth. And speaking about buildings, uh, you know, since I've written to you and, and called, we're going to be talking about the gas holder, uh, that that great big hunk of brick down on South Main Street. Uh, Byron, what attracts you to that? Well, I don't know. I mean, it is a pretty iconic building, Bob. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's been a it's been a landmark ever since ever since I've started to, to live in, in, in Concord. I, I guess, you know, my, one of my questions is, what are you trying to do with it? I mean, it's my understanding is that uh, it's been abandoned for a long time. You know, it's it's in some disrepair. Uh, you know, uh, uh, why are you, uh, you know, why are you engaged in this in this fundraiser? Well, like you, I have an interest in history. And when I learned that this building was the last of its kind that's intact in the United States, and I live in this town, that's not going to get away from me. And so uh, when they said to me, would you be willing to help raise money to save this building? I said, well, yes, I'd be happy to do that. But I'd sure also like to know, you know, what is entailed in saving this big building? Uh, I would gather that because it was involved with coal gas, there must be a lot of, of uh, mitigation of contaminants underneath the soil. And I'm glad to hear that the owner uh, is so concerned that they did a brief survey and found out that uh, it was going to cost more to tear the building down uh, than it would be to restore it because they'd have to do something to get rid of the contaminants. So that's how I got involved in this, Byron. And, and uh, we, have, we have in front of us uh, a plan to save it. Uh, we have the people uh, lined up who have the ability to save it. First, uh, reinforcing it so it doesn't fall down and then in a second phase to uh, find a use for this because it's certainly going to be a unique building to try to uh, introduce to the public and have it be used as part of the history of Concord. So in that light, um, uh, do you see yourself at some point being interested in this campaign? Well, I, I think I might be, Bob. I mean, like you, I, I, I share an interest in history and, and, and I understand that the building is on the National Register and, and it's, a, it's considered to be an important structure. I guess it's just a question to me. Uh, one of the questions is, you know, what's your, what are your short-term goals and your long-term goals? You know, what, what do you, you know, and what's the, what's the goal of this, uh, of this fundraising campaign that you're engaged in? Well, Byron, I'm so glad you asked that because the first thing that happened, as you may have noticed, that a tree fell on the roof about four or five years ago, let water in. The internal structure of this building is wood. And we know what happens when wood and water stick around together for a long time. So there are wooden portions inside this building that uh, are ready to collapse. And a good, heavy, concrete snowstorm is going to make that happen. So the initial phase is to support the building so that it doesn't fall down, which means supporting the roof. So they're going to tie around inside this building uh, these big wooden rings that act like a girdle uh, to support the roof 
and keep it from falling in. And by doing that, we buy ourselves some time to figure out the second phase. Now that first phase uh, is going to run something, fortunately, less than a million dollars. Uh, and it's, we've had this wonderful gift, an anonymous gift. We don't know who it is, but he gave us half a million dollars. Mm. And that was a wonderful start. The second phase of the campaign is going to be uh, much more involved. And once fully thought out, we're looking at a campaign probably in the order of three to four million dollars. Mm. There'll be a third phase after that, and that is to develop the park-like area around the building. And no cost estimate has been settled for that. So initially, Byron, I would say that we're looking at this initial campaign of raising about a million dollars, half of which we've raised. And looking at this and knowing your interest, I'm wondering if you would be, could be helpful for this campaign by considering a gift in the range of $25,000 over a period of four years. Yeah, Bob, I, I, I think I, I'd consider that. I think I'd want to talk to, to, to Susie about it and make sure that, that she's on board. Uh, but 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 that sounds that sounds reachable uh, and attainable. Is, uh, is there any recognition level connected with that, that level of gift? I would have to say, Byron, that we have not for that, we have not decided on various sections of this that would require a name attached to it. A gift of $25,000, I can assure you, will be something more than a plaque on the wall. And that would be just wonderful if for you to consider that. We'd be very grateful. All right. Well, let, let, again, uh, you know, I'm not making a firm commitment right now, but let me talk to Susie. Uh, and, uh, and, and if you don't hear from me in, in, in three or four days, please feel free to reach out and rattle my cage. Well, actually, I want to do more than rattle your cage. I want to, I want to call you and make an appointment right now while we're sitting together. Huh. I'd like to come back in two weeks. Can we do that? We can do that. I'll, I'll look at my calendar and we'll schedule a time. Thank you so much, Byron. Nice. Well, we kind of want to know what happens in two weeks, right? But I think <laughs> the, only well, thing I love the yeah, the only thing I would add to that, and because Bob did this the last time we did that. Bob, you didn't ask me if I knew other people who might be in. Oh, right, right, right. Giving. Oh, good. He was going to say that at the door as he left, I bet. But no, that is <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that as another great element. So I heard a lot of, uh, I heard or saw a lot of listening, really trying to get to know Byron's interests, connecting the interests, talking about your personal commitment and why you were excited, Bob. There was the sense of urgency. This building is gonna fall down. Um, great, a lot of really positive themes there. Yeah, well, before we open it up, I just wanted to ask you the, um, a classic question that we get about um, sustaining efforts. A lot of these projects take a long time. They have, you know, extra positive things that happen unexpectedly and negatives, um, especially for volunteer groups. What, what do you, what advice do you have or encouragement do you have for folks that are getting tired or discouraged <laughs> as they work through this? What, anything you found over the years that you want to share? Uh, Byron, Bob first, Bob first, thank yeah. you. I had some good advice uh, about length of campaigns. And if you have a campaign which is going to run on more than five years, uh, usually, <clears throat> excuse me, after three years, the people who are your campaign cabinet, your solicitors, are getting very tired. They're getting a little burned out. Uh, the goal may not have been reached and so they may be a little discouraged which means that their enthusiasm is, is beginning to lag. It's time to have a new committee with, with fresh enthusiasm and so forth. So I think a time limit on your campaign people, uh, I think three years is a 
good time to say, I'd like you to help me with my campaign. And I'm only gonna be doing this for three years. And I would ask you if you'd be on my team and you would stay for three years. And at the end of three years, both of us will be done. Yeah, I, I would, that, that's great advice. Um, I, I also, earlier when we were talking, I was thinking, and I thought this might be the place to mention it. Uh, every, every solicitation is an opportunity for training for people that you can that you're trying to bring up through your organization. For example, uh, you know, if, if I was running a campaign and you know, and I had somebody who didn't really know the ropes but had desire and interest, I would I would have them tag along with Bob. Uh, and just just you know you know uh, and Bob, you tell me if you think that's off off base, but oh hardly. Yeah, and and uh, you know it, it's just I mean even you know I think maybe I heard Bob once tell a story about accompanying somebody who was a senior partner in solicitation himself. It might have been Kim and Zakis or somebody else. And, you know, I've talked to many people who accompanied, say, Marty Gross, these are Concord folks, or, or, uh, or uh, 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 Malcolm McLean, you know, to make, to make asks, because those were guys who really knew how to do it. So I would also, in addition to what Bob said, I would just also think about how you can develop the kind of the next the next wave of of solicitors, uh, and sometimes just tagging along and uh, and 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 uh, and and listening and and understand coming to understand the process would be very helpful. I did that once with M T Menino, who was the first executive director at the Capital Center for the Arts. I just tagged along as one of the members of her board during a campaign and listened to her do solicitations, and it was incredibly helpful. It's called your farm team. Yep. Farm team. Good point. Good point. And then I think every group is different, but you know, finding a schedule that really fits. I know there was a uh, a wonderful, successful venture in the Lakes region, and they met, you know, every Wednesday morning for thirty minutes for a while just to get them up to speed. And then they decided, okay, we've done that for a while. Let's let's change it up, have a different communication, a different meeting system. Um, similarly, little things just like celebrating your success. Again, it's going to be different uh, organization to organization, group to group, what your culture is. But just remember that sort of really being proud of progress you have made. Oh, it's absolutely. Now sort of a, a right sized way to use that. And maybe it changes over time to give your group that, you know, those the boosts they need to keep it going, keep it going. A freshening. Yeah. 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 Um, let's turn to the questions. Feel free to chat um, just to me or to the whole group. Um, let's do it by chat. And then, I mean, it's a small enough group. We can all, you can also just take yourself off of the, the microphone if there's a minute and ask your question directly. There's no good or bad questions. And um, we also uh, love ideas that you have on any of these topics. Doesn't have to be a question. It can be a suggestion. Um, so, uh, Back to the sort of um, creating your list of prospective donors. Where can you find useful information about prospective donors? <coughs> Are there information sources that you can recommend, such as philanthropic interests, financial? Oh, these are features to, to understand their their interests, the donors' interests, financial capacity or history. Um, I think there's one answer to this. If you're Harvard, back to Bob being at graduation, and there's another answer maybe if you're a volunteer group that's um, trying to spend as little money as possible and use human resources instead of financial resources to get the job done. Um, any ideas? Bob, do you want to go first on that or? Um, well, again, it's your, membership, yeah. your membership list. And, yeah. and uh, also if, it, if it's a small community uh, that has some businesses, um, it's important that the uh, executive director uh, and whoever is, if, if there's going to be a, a lead solicitor person uh, that you visit, you know, local businesses and so forth, not to ask them for money, not to ask them for money at all, but to introduce them to that you're going to be doing something with what it is that you're working for. So it's called cultivation. And so you, and the first thing they're going to see, ask you, well, are you asking me for any money? And you want to say, no, 
I'm not asking for any money. I just want you to know, you know, that this church that we're trying to get the stained glass windows repaired, uh, just want you to know about it because I know that once in a while, you know, your daughter was married here. We don't want those windows to fall down. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Byron, you've probably been part of, well, you both have been part of organizations that paid to use services to get research, um, which, you know, can, uh, the, the community stuff really does work if you just keep working the networks and getting people in yeah. confidential yeah. settings to um, share what they know about people's interest and capacity. Yeah, I, I would just say it's important to realize that, that the launch of a campaign is not the time to try to figure out who your friends are. You know, I'll say what Bob said in a different way. And, and, and if you remember the PowerPoint that Jennifer went through, where she said that the fundraising was 5% solicitation and went 95% or whatever it was of um, uh, stewardship. Uh, you know, you really need to be working on making these, these friends, friendships, creating these relationships in advance of any sort of major fundraising campaign that you that you you carry out you know your organization needs to be thinking about this and needs to be making uh, and establishing these relationships in a variety of ways you know uh, by holding you know by holding uh, you know seminars meetings collecting names collecting email addresses you know I, you know identifying who's interested in your mission in that way um, and so, you know, if you're planning, if you think, for example, on, on June 2nd, 2022, that you, that you need to launch a, a capital campaign in, on January 1st, 2023, you should be working right now to create those relationships and identify those people who you're going to start, start approaching uh, in 2023. Um, there's not a fast and easy way to do this unless you have a lot of money. Uh, you know, as Jennifer says, you can buy lists and things, uh, you know, and and do surveys of people with capacity, but capacity is, an in, is not interest, to go back to what Bob said. You know, that just means somebody has money. It doesn't mean they're going to part with it for you. People who are going to contribute are people who really have an interest in, 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 in your, pro your organization and or your project. Let's talk about... Um... Oh, I'm going to uh, answer a question about um, campaign length and use of a use of a consultant, and then um, Mr. Montgomery, you could go after that. Um, so uh, there's at least two parts to this question about the campaigns. Uh, it would be we kind of skipped over the use of a consultant. Um, I, I I wanted this conversation to feel accessible even to all volunteer run um, situations, but. But certainly a fundraising consultant can be very, very, very useful and a great use of money. So I guess I would love uh, one or the other of you just to talk a little bit about ways to use a consultant for, for feasibility and for managing the campaign. And interrelated in that question was, um, well, let me ask that first and then I'll ask about length of campaign. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that you know uh, a consultant can be that ramrod that I, I talked about before for the cattle drive. It can be the person who keeps you on track, who uh, you know makes sure that you have regular check-ins uh, to see you know how people are doing with their goals, with with their assignments. Um, and that's the person who can also help you create that that donor pyramid uh, with realistic goals and you know and and again. One of the things that I think I would emphasize from that, that PowerPoint presentation that Jennifer gave was that you need to have a lot more prospects than the number of final donors that you need. You know, and I think that, that looking at that, uh, that donor pyramid that, uh, or that donor chart that, that, that Jennifer shared, it was generally two to one or three to one uh, you know, in terms of number of people that you had to solicit versus number of people who, who needed to give you a gift. Um, so you need to have a large pool uh, in order to reach your, your goal. That's correct. I think statistically, uh, professional consultants will say that of every four solicitations you make, you'll have one success. And we've had excellent, we and in our, in our constituents, groups like yours have had 
uh, I think a great return on investment of hiring consultants over time. And I think just being a really good client or working with a consultant that can work with different kinds of clients is important. We don't have a comprehensive list, list but I'm happy to make some suggestions if you wanna follow up with me afterwards. I mentioned feasibility is sort of a formal step that a lot of campaigns have, and that can be a really they big must. project. That, that's a must. And, and you can do it a little more informally, <laughs> or you can do it really big and really informally, and formally. And I think it depends on what you're <laughs> after and, and who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. The, um, I, I consider the feasibility study like uh, you're gonna paint your house. And the first thing that you need to do is to scrape the paint off. You need to find out what's going on. And the end result is going to depend on the feasibility study. Yep. It really is. Because what is a feasibility study? Is it feasible? <laughs> is, the money, is the money there? And are you ready to do a campaign? And a really good one I'll give you, or a practical one, is going to give you advice about how to get ready. Yes. Or Re rejigger the phasing or rejigger the totals in a way that really works for you. Yes. Um, embedded in that was was sort of what's is there a, a good target for the number of years? Bob, you talked before about if things were going long, it was a five year campaign to make sure you have turnover in three. I guess related to this term question is how long the committee's doing the work and how long your pledges are for. You want to respond on both of those? I think three years is a pretty typical number. It for is a big capital campaign, don't you yeah. think? And so long the, enough to get it done, but yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. What, oh, sorry, go ahead, Bob. Did you have something else to say? No, no, no. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, and I, I see that I think Maria Barth uh, had her hand up, but one of the things we haven't really talked about is that generally speaking. Every capital campaign has two phases. They have a silent phase and then they have the public phase. Yeah, and, yeah. and the silent phase is where you you raise the majority of your money. And I think yeah, I'm working with a, a small ad hoc group right now uh, uh, that is having a very difficult time understanding the difference and understanding, you know, and generally speaking, your silent phase is where you, <clears throat> you receive the large lead gifts. And you really want to, I'm not sure what the rubric is these days, Bob, you may know, or Jennifer, you know, generally you want to, to uh, uh, have the majority of your money committed during the silent phase before you announce the campaign publicly and then go after those smaller gifts that are gonna make up the balance. That is correct. Uh, you know, and I don't know what the percentage is these days. <clears throat> you know, do you, Bob? It depends on the pro project and the- it's Yeah. Probably around 60, than, between 60 and 70%. Yeah, yeah. yeah, during the silent phase, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to call on Mr. Montgomery next, and then um, Ms. Barth after that. Well, hi, everybody. It's great to be part of this organization. I'm on the western edge of New Hampshire, and I'm new to the historic preservation community, but I may be about to uh, join that community um, soon. Uh, and um, I've been doing capital campaigning for a very long time. I won't yeah. bore you with all the wizened advice I might offer. I know you're trying to uh, squeeze a lot into one hour, and I'm grateful to um, uh, uh, all of you for presenting this way. I think it's really important to say a couple of things. One is relationships with your constituents are not transactions. Um, when you're trying to get people to optimize their commitment to your institution, they need to think about fulfilling their own mission and vision as yeah. well as the mission and vision of the institution. And uh, although you did a very effective role play there of gathering 25, 000, potentially $25,000 in a, a mere you know, 15 minutes of conversation, um, the people who you're going to get the most money from are the people you have strongest relationships with who also have significant capacity to give. People are afraid of the act of asking, but they're generally not afraid of the act of making friends and sustaining friendships that reflect all the integrity of all the individuals involved. So just, I just wanted to note nice that. I, yeah. Yeah. A, a couple of things and I'll shut up. I'm really interested in what you have to say. One is that I think in smallish organizations, particularly people love to have an opportunity to be a hero. And I'm guessing that most of the people on this call are involved in organizations where being a hero costs a lot less than it costs to, um, to be a hero at Harvard. Um, and so people who are com committed to their communities 
and the institutions they care about can actually have a transformative impact on those institutions with relatively modest contributions. I think that's a, a special niche for those of us uh, in New Hampshire. Um, and for the I money get, and for the time, I think I'd make both of those points that you can be a hero because you're on this campaign and you get to revive the meeting house. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, it, and it's part of the community that you have been affiliated with maybe for generations, right? So yeah. you're among uh, you're among patri uh, compatriots, uh, comrades, if you will, in saving things that matter to all of us. What a, what a lovely luxury and gift that is to each of us, not just to the charities. Uh, one last thing, um, and, and I'm sure most of you have heard this, if you want um, money, ask for advice, and if you want advice, ask for money. Um, so part of what works best is to actually engage people in what they have to, to offer in terms of what they know and who they know and what they think about and what they love and where they chose to spend that quiet two hours uh, at, the, at, the, at the pond next to the mill the, during their childhood. Um, if you can get warm up people's hearts, it is essential in warming up their wallets too. And I don't mean those to be um, uh, as trite as that sounds. I mean it to be quite genuine. Wouldn't you like to join me, Jennifer, in playing a leadership role in preserving this remarkable asset that not only do we love, but we want our kids and our grandkids to have available to them. That kind of warm fuzzy is way more effective in my experience than we have a need, you get to fill it on our timetable, give us your dough. Uh, right. I do think an ag aggressive timetable is wonderful. We're trying to get this done quickly so we can all enjoy it better and it won't fall down anymore. But I, I do think, um, being careful to avoid, you know, what's your name? I hear you have some money. Uh, give us your dough. And I, I know that's not what you were doing, um, but there is the risk that some people will see it that way if you haven't used your own integrity and your own credibility to move the conversation forward, not necessarily just to the end point of what can we put you down for? Because um, you're going to live with these people whether they give or not in right. your community. Right. I'll be quiet now. No, Thank really you for nice listening. points. That's really nice. Great. Welcome to the preservation community. Thank you. Maria, Ms. Barth, did you want to add something or did it pass us by? <laughs> I would like to ask for help. I'm the chair of the Warner House Association in Portsmouth, which is a small um, house museum. Portsmouth has several house museums kind of competing with each other. I became chair by default because all the people that knew anything about the house, had history with the house, had run the house, uh, resigned. And I'm a geriatric, dyslexic immigrant, and I'm trying to figure out what to do. We have a very part-time uh, hired director or manager, and we have board members. Most of them are very excited about giving free cupcakes and music in the garden to total strangers. But we also have three big construction projects that the house will either fall down or we get busy raising the money. Well, you're you're so not alone. You're not alone. I need the help to explain to people the cupcakes are great, but <laughs> the cocktail party for the donors might be more important. Or you tell me. What's the low hanging fruit there and how does she help change culture? Any, who wants to go first? <laughs> Bob. Um. <laughs> bring somebody, I mean, I've, we've started as simply as, you know, you, you bring another voice to a board meeting and you really explore where the, where the low hanging fruit is. What has worked well historically? Who is ready to help? No, because they left. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd they go? 
I don't know. The left me in the lurch. <laughs> You know, I don't know that there are a lot of easy answers, uh, uh, Maria, uh, and I wish there were. Uh, I mean, what I'm tempted to say, and this is not going to help you at all, that there may be too many independent historic house museums in Portsmouth. Maybe what needs to happen is rather than having individual boards, they need to, com they need to combine for economies of scale uh, and, and, and collectively work together. Uh, that's easy for me to say. I'm over here in Concord, and and you know I'm not in your world. Um, but uh, you, you know, I, again, I don't think there's an easy answer. It sounds like what you need is really to reinvigorate your your board. Uh, uh, you know, there there really is a question about why have you lost those people. I know you can't answer that, but something happened so that you lost some people who are engaged. Um, and that could be institutional, it could be personalities, it could be a lot of different things. But it sounds like in order to, to reach your fundraising goals, you need to reconstitute the board. You've got a lot of cupcake bakers and not a lot of cocktail party people, and you need to identify and bring in some of these, you know, some of the, the, the people with the skill set and with the desire that you need. Um, that's the best that I can do. Uh, that's the best advice that I can give. <laughs> Or you could really, really get bold and move outside the box of joining two or three other independent house museums that may have much the same concerns that you do and join together as a group. And so it might require reconstituting the uh, governing structure of three or four or two or three houses that would join together and be sort of a group um, house museum consortium, combining boards, combining fundraising capabilities and so forth. It'd be a very bold move, but it has been done in the past. And I think it might be in your situation, uh, some sort of salvation to your ability to cope with the situation that has exists. Feel free to follow up. I, I thank you for that input. It's not a simple answer, of course, but feel free, we could brainstorm about um, people and next steps outside of this conversation. And that's that's true of the rest of you too. Does anybody have a last question before I close? Not right now. We will be sending some um, follow up links, some other um, great resource information on fundraising that. Uh, hopefully it's useful to you or some of these things you might want to, if you think it's a good fit, you might actually want to get your whole group to read and have a conversation about it after everybody's had some homework um, to review. Um, we're also going to send out an evaluation really quick, but would love your feedback that'll help us plan this and other programs. A lot of stuff on our website that we'll send it to you. Because this is a fundraising session for, or for any session, I have to make a fundraising plug, right? And say that 80% of the support for the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance comes from people like you. And um, we have an exciting new strategic plan and we wanna keep up the best of the old um, to help organizations like yours get more preservation work done across the state and take on some new challenges. So um, consider support and thank you to all of you who are already donors to the organization for sure. Um, it's a, um, I just um, love the themes that came across today in terms of um, uh, the ability to be a hero in your community, to be, to grab people who are really passionate about what you're doing and to find ways to, you know, keep taking your vitamins and make progress and get to the end goal. So wherever you are on the journey, we wish you luck for the next steps and Keep connected to the Preservation Alliance. We want to help. All right. Goodbye for now. Be in touch. Thanks for participating. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to Bob and to Byron for your time as well. Always Thank a you. pleasure. Indeed, always a pleasure. Thank you.